morning. Welcome to Pleasant Grove United Methodist Church on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. We're glad you're here with us today. I just have a couple things to share with you before I turn it over to Ashley for the community update. First of all, we're going to have a lot of things happen, and you'll hear about a number of them from Ashley. But we have things like confirmation class starting next week, and that will be held virtually. Um, We also will have a number of things as we move into the season of Lent, which begins in just a few weeks. And we prepare 40 days to prepare for the celebration of Easter. So hope you'll follow along on announcements, check out the website, and find things that might be of interest to you. We're also going to have some interesting um, ways to to kick off the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday. And we're still kind of fine-tuning some of those details. But again, stay tuned for that. Once again, each week, I I try to thank you for all that you do to support your church during these difficult times. And I, I want to thank you for your financial support of the church. You have been so generous across these many months. It's almost a year. I cannot believe it's been almost a year since we have been to really able to be together as a, as a full community. But I want to thank you for the way you have supported your church. And if you'd like to continue to support your church, you can do so. And, and I won't go into the details today, but you know you can check out the website. You can call us to find how you can, can make a contribution to the church. So anyway, it's great to have you. And let me turn it over to Ashley for a quick update. Ashley. Thanks, Jay. Today is our last day to put in orders for our flower fundraiser for Valentine's Day. This fundraiser is being sponsored by Middle School Youth Group, and they chose last week that the proceeds from this fundraiser will go to NC Diaper Bank. And this is an organization that they've volunteered at before, but they're looking forward to financially supporting them and their cause with this fundraiser. Again, today is the last day to put in those orders, and those orders will either be delivered or picked up depending on your choosing on Saturday, February 13th. You can find information and the order forms on our website, pgumc.org. Next Sunday, February 7th, we will begin our confirmation classes in, at 3 p.m. via Zoom. This will be an open house, so we, we welcome both parents and youth to be there. We recommend for confirmation, fifth grade and older Um, for the appropriateness of the conversation and to be able to get as much of it as as you can out of it. So again, confirmation will begin next week, February 7th at 3 p.m. And that Zoom link will go out via our church announcements as well as put on our website uh, next weekend. The Journey class is one of our adult Sunday school classes that is continuing to meet during the pandemic. And they meet Sundays at 10 a.m. and would welcome anyone who wants to join them. They discuss current event topics and how they relate to scripture. So if you are interested in joining that class, please contact Danny or Lucinda Sullivan, or you can contact me and I can put you in touch with them. We also have other adult Sunday schools if you're interested in joining as well. Lastly, I announced this last week that we are trying to do a visual art gallery here at Pleasant Grove, and the theme we have is new life, and we want to be able to showcase this art gallery virtually as well as in the Welcome Center. Um, uh, March 29th through 31st is when the artwork would be due. So from you, you know, if you have a gift in quilting or painting or drawing or photography or whatnot, and you would like to submit a full piece of artwork based on the theme New Life, we would love for you to do that. And you can email Chris Dotson to let him know that you are interested, as well as answer any questions you have. Again, that that artwork would need to be due by March 29th. Next, excuse me. Next week, we will uh, be announcing more information on Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is February 17th this year. It's a Wednesday. Um, so we will be doing something for you for that, for that special day. Um, so be on the lookout for ima- information for that. I hope you have enjoyed a little bit of snow and sunshine this week. It definitely has perked my mood up. And I hope it has with yours as well. Thank you, Ashley. Now it's time just to take a deep breath, exhale, and just settle. Settle. And as we listen to this centering piece, prepare yourself for worship.
Friends, let us now join our hearts in prayer as we bow for our invocation. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we gather here this morning so that we might be renewed by your spirit. We pray for the strength in our lives to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. We wait for the moving of your presence in our lives anew this day. And for that presence, we give you thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join in song as we sing our opening hymn, I'm Trading My Sorrows. The epistle reading for today is Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag and seal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Friends, I invite you to pause the service for a few seconds, and I invite you to go to your, your phones and your doors and your windows and your computers and extend the peace of Christ. Extend the love of God to others. Maybe people you haven't talked to in a while. Maybe send them a text or send them an email or call them and just remind them that, that you miss them and that you love them and that, that God loves them. And um, extend the peace of Christ. You know how to do it. So let's go. Share God's love. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. As I read these familiar words, listen for something new that's being spoken into your life and into your heart at this particular point on your faith journey. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right. Three simple rules. That's what we're talking about this morning. Just three simple rules. Is that too much to ask? I don't think so. I don't think so. Rule number one, do no harm. Rule number two, do good. Rule number three, stay in love with God. Friends, these three simple rules are at the heart, lie at the heart of what it means to be United Methodist. You see, in the first half of the 18th century, young Anglican priest John Wesley organized a community of folks into small groups called classes. And the folks who came to be so organized did so because in their heart of hearts, they knew that there had to be something more to life and existence than they were currently experiencing. They knew that life in general had to have a deeper level of meaning, and they were determined to find that level of deep meaning through, a, through the practice of intentional living within the context of a covenant community that would hold them accountable. All right. In order to accomplish their goal, they, they gathered weekly on Thursday evenings to be challenged to be encouraged, to be confronted by the grace of God incarnate in their brothers and sisters in Christ. And in keeping with the Methodist ethos, it was a practical way to follow Jesus, a practical way to be a follower. Okay. Do you ever feel restless? You know, pandemic notwithstanding, do you ever feel that life just makes no sense, you know, the way you're leading it now? It's a grind. It's stress-filled. It doesn't appear to be moving in any given direction. You're just stuck. Day in and day out, you go through the motions of existence. Have you ever felt that way? Good, good. Well, I, well, I don't, don't mean good, but, but you're not alone. People have felt like this forever, forever. The author of the book of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, as she is called, writes this. 
Futility of futility, says the teacher. Emptiness of emptiness. All is empty. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but all the earth remains the same forever. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like everything that you do is futile? Those words were written over 2,200 years ago. You know, some things never change. Some things never change. There's just something about being human that tends to transcend time and place and culture. You know, we don't want to settle for a life of drudgery. No, we want a, a spiritual vitality that brings abundant life in spite of our circumstances, don't we? Sure we do. Sure we do. Okay, what must I do to find this kind of life, asked the young man. And Jesus answered, well, you tell me. You already know, right? And the young man said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, oh, that was Deut Deuteronomy 6. And your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Jesus then said to him, and listen carefully, that's it. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. As I said last week, we in the United Methodist Church call this perfection. Perfect love of God and others. And we seek this perfect, perfection knowing that by the grace of God working in and through our lives, we can achieve it. You know, after all, Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We take Jesus at his word. For to dismiss such a life as an impossibility is to deny the power of God to change us, to renew us, to transform us. You know, to come to such a conclusion that there is no hope would be incredibly, incredibly disheartening and tragic. Indeed, we would have to cry out with the teacher. Futility of futility, says the teacher. Emptiness of emptiness. All is empty. Well, the young man refused to give up hope. He said to Jesus, what must I do so that I might, my, that my life might find some, you know, depth of richness? But did you hear that? What must I do? What must I do? In other words, what action must I take? How must I order my living so that I might find life? Friends, that's how we United Methodists, I think, see things. You know, what must I do in order in, to, to grow in my, in order that I might grow in my life and in my faith? Well, John Wesley said, well, let's start with just three practices, three simple practices. And these simple practices were, number one, do no harm. Do no harm. Practice two, do good. Practice three, stay in love with God. You know. What must I do? Well, here are things you can do. Last week, we talked about doing no harm. So the question was, how do we go about doing no harm in our lives? And you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that for me, it really boils down to two things. First, doing no more harm. You know, you know hands off the throttle, ease back, ease back. And, and, as in, I need to begin by stopping those life practices in which I engage it tend toward the destruction of others, destruction of self, and destruction of this God-given world. Just ease up, ease up in what I'm doing. And you know, that's very difficult, difficult because obviously I've been desensitized to the effects of my living. You know, it's going to require some serious self-criticism and self-reflection. And like the early Methodists, I, I'm going to need the help of others. You know, I'm going to need your help. Where am I doing harm about which I am unaware? You know, this is a value of small, what we call covenant groups. You know, the Methodist classes of old. John Wesley said, avoid evil of every kind. 
Now, I'm sure you remember the list I rattled off for you last week, Wesley's list. You know, he, he was a sharp fellow. Now, you remember number eight. Number eight, you remember that? On the do no harm list. Now, I want you, I want you to commit this to memory like you used to commit uh, Bible verses to memory. Do no harm, rule number eight. Avoid uncharitable or unprofitable conversations, particularly, now pay attention to this, speaking evil of magistrates or of ministers, all caps, ministers. You know, at first, the idea of do no harm sounds rather passive, right? You know, do no harm, you know, do nothing that harms, avoid harm. But there's really a lot more to it than that. It's not just about stopping. It's not just about letting up on the throttle that will move us forward. No, doing, you know, doing no harm also requires a reverse, kind of a reverse engineering of our lives. In other words, how can I get back to that baseline of living from which I diverged at some particular point in my life? It, it, you know, it may have been years ago. Years ago. It may have been shortly after I stood up before a, the community, a community like this at Pleasant Grove, and committed to live with the folks in that community in a covenant of grace. Have you ever had those conversations with your kids or maybe your parents had with you during which things just seem to deteriorate, deteriorate the more you, you talk? You know, may, maybe they said something that was just totally out of line. I'm talking about your kids. And then as you called them on it, they did what we call a double down, a double down. And by that, I mean, in, in an attempt to save face or defend the indefensible, they took the absurdity up a notch, you know. And depending on how adept they were at this ludicrousness, the conversation began to spiral out of control. And at some point in the process, you, you just couldn't take it any longer. And you had to interject with something along the lines of, you better stop digging. You better stop digging. You better stop digging as in you're digging yourself into a deep hole from which it'll be very, very difficult to extract yourself. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? You're only digging the hole deeper. So just stop. Just stop. For goodness sake, just stop. Friends, that captures the spirit of doing no harm. For goodness sake, stop digging. We, you and I, need to stop digging the hole deeper because it's only when we stop digging that we can begin to backfill and ultimately, by the grace of God, get back to where we need to be. Do no harm. Did you practice that this past week? It was your homework. Were you conscious of that this past week? And if not, we'll try this week. That's what I like about it. You always have next week. Okay. But I'm going to make it a little bit more challenging for you this week. You see, not only are we going to do no harm, but we're also going to attempt to incorporate rule number two. Do good. Okay, let's think about that for a minute. What good do we do? You know, what good do you do in your life? Um, to whom do you do good? Just, just ponder that. That, that. I think that's a good place to start. Okay, how are we going to accomplish this task? How are we going to keep rule number two? Now, no pressure here, but let's hear the words from the epistle of 3 John, the first half of verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does good is from God. Do good. But, but again, how? How? You know, my tendency here would be to make a list. You know, I would list the things that I want to do that would accomplish this goal. But the problem I encounter when I actually try to make make the list, is the sheer enormity of the task. You know, where do you begin to make a to-do good list? 
you know. Okay, open doors for folks, check. Be polite, check. Pick up litter, check. Give food to the food bank, check. Call a sick neighbor, check. Write a thank you note. Get a get well card, you know, a, a, you know, a thinking of you card, check. You know, the list goes on and on and on. But no matter how long it gets, it never seems to be sufficient. There is always a ton more good to do. I noticed in his list of rules, John Wesley even had difficulty putting meat on these bones, so to speak. He, he did say give food to the hungry, clothe the naked and visit the sick and the imprisoned. But beyond that, it was a bit sketchy. For instance, be in every kind of merciful okay be do good of every possible sort to all people instruct reprove and exhort take up your cross daily well you get the point what do these actions behaviors actually look like in real life well, in his book on the general rules, Bishop Rubin acknowledges that the list approach to achieving goodness can quickly get out of hand. He writes, and I already have too many responsibilities, too many commitments, and too many others who depend upon me. Okay, so what do we do then? What do we do then? Okay, just take a deep breath. <sighs> All right, and listen carefully. We do nothing. We do nothing. I, I, I know what you're thinking. That makes absolutely no sense, Jay. Well, maybe not. But it won't be the first time or the last time that Jay Minnick didn't make sense. But hear me out anyway. Hear, hear me out anyway. I call it incarnational goodness. Incarnational goodness goodness. This theology of incarnational goodness is grounded in two very basic affirmations of our faith. First, at some basic level of our being, we are grounded in the divine. Ground, grounded in God's self. And the author of Genesis 1 claims this belief for us in these words. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, so God created humankind in the divine image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And second, Genesis 1, 31. God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was very good. Do you believe that? Do you believe that somewhere deep within your soul lies the sacred image? Sure, sure. We have... We may have all worked diligently and tirelessly at defacing and obscuring that image. But do you believe that God's image is stamped on you? It's a basic theological affirmation. Humans aren't evil. Humans aren't evil. How can we be? Goodness has somehow been enfleshed in us. Incarnational goodness. You know, just a few weeks ago, we talked about the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is a claiming of our identity as creatures that bear the image of a gracious God. For those too young or, or unable to consciously claim such an identity, the community claims it for them. And then comes together to live into that identity with them. In a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gathers it up with these words. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Friends, doing good is not about list. It's about life. It's about being the salt of the earth. It's about being the light of the world. John Wesley instilled in a people called Methodists the belief that a faith that is grounded in the grace of a loving God should be a faith that is continually pouring out God's grace, God's love, God's presence into the world through a life that is working to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's who we are. That's who we are, folks. And so each and every day we, we should recall to mind that adage that practice makes perfect.
And that's what we're doing. We're practicing, hoping to be made perfect. So this week, do no harm and do good. Next week, rule number three. See you then. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to go to God in prayer, we need to, to lift up prayers that are on our hearts, prayers that we wish to share with the community. Today, there are two ways for you to do that. You can either call the church office at 919-787-7763 and leave your prayer, joy, or concern on the voice, voicemail. Or you can go to the church website at pgumc.org uh, and you can email your concern or joy to the church office. And then at the beginning of the week, tomorrow, Julie will compile that list and she will distribute that through our weekly prayer email. Now, I know there are many prayers that weigh on us individually and collectively, and many of them we, that are, are just too close to our hearts to lift publicly. And so what we need to do, we need to spend some time in silent prayer. So we always begin our prayer time each week in silent prayer, we follow that with a brief pastoral prayer, and then we conclude our prayer time each week with the Lord's Prayer. So let's now begin with a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. pray. We often come to this moment, O oh God, with little expectancy. It's what we've done dozens, even hundreds of times. And we've forgotten how radical it is to consciously acknowledge that we are immersed in your presence. Jog our memories this morning. Teach us to be in your presence with open hearts and willing spirits. So at this time is, is not routine or dull. Imbue us with your Holy Spirit. Show us the possibilities of life that lie beyond our, our recognition. Free us from the lethargy and apathy that bind our spirits. Lead us out of paralyzing preoccupation with self and use us to reveal your grace. Loving and sustaining God, we ask this and all our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we have a very special guest with us here today who is here to share his musical talents with us. You know him. It's Mr. Pepper Choplin. He lives here in Raleigh, and he is a dear friend of this community of faith. And we thank him for coming today and sharing a song with us. He, he both wrote it and will perform it for us. One step he leads. Thank you for being with us today, Pepper. Well, good morning. I'd like to share a song with you that I wrote uh, several years ago. Um, I'm the kind of guy who wants to know what's going to happen in five years from now and 10 years from now. I was always planning, especially when I was, I was younger, uh, my strategy for life. And uh, I'm the guy who, if he sees a gift under the Christmas tree, I want to open it up right then. And so I have a hard time with waiting for things. And uh, uh, there was a time in my life where I was going through a lot of struggles and I just came to the realization that I can't worry about the future all the time. I would just give the Lord one step 
and another step day by day by day. And I'd like to share that song with you. Sometimes I worry and wish I could see what lies ahead and what the future will be. But God calls me on to follow in faith and He'll take tomorrow if I give Him today. One step He leads and one step I'll follow. God knows my needs and He will supply. I don't know the future and all of that's in store. So I'll take one step, one step to follow my Lord. Jesus said, leave all your worries, forget all your cares, what you will eat and what you will wear. But seek first my kingdom, and all of that is right. Your needs shall be given as you live in the light. One step he leads, and one step I'll follow. God knows my needs. And he will supply I don't know the future And all of that's in store So I'll take one step One step To follow To follow Just one step He leads And one step I'll follow God knows my needs And he And all of that's in store So I'll take one step, one step To follow, to follow my Lord So I'll take one step, one step To follow, to follow my Lord Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and forevermore. Go now from the sanctuary in peace. Amen.